Hello, thanks a lot. Um, yeah, short from my person, I'm, I'm Mark. I am uh, working as a data guy at Codecentric, uh, mainly working with Python, um, working on deep learning tasks and a bit of data engineering. And um, yeah, I'm happy that so many people are here. And I would like to, to talk a little bit about the journey of, of OCR, our journey of uh, yeah, grabbing text from, from scanned pages um, at one of our customers. And this is actually a system that we built and that's working in production. And I would like to, to show you a little bit. So what we did, how we did it, and um, especially how easy it is to build a, um, a good working system and, and where are all the tweaks that you can apply to build an even better system. So yeah, shortly. So what we are talking about for people that don't know OCR, we are talking about optical character recognition and um, mainly the, 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 the least things that we are working on in reality is, is, is the OCR itself. We use Tesseract for it, which is a library or a, a binary by Google. Awesome. Um, so let's go through it. And I will show you a little bit uh, the tips and tricks that you can do to utilize an open source library or an open source system using uh, stuff like OpenCV. And then we will go on and see, okay, where can we store data? What can we do to make our results better? And uh, we will see um, how you can even, yeah, trick a little bit to get better results using Elasticsearch. Um, let's start. So the first thing is we want to start with what kind of little things we can do with a few lines of code. Um, best, at, at, at best that we don't have to implement them ourselves um, to make documents better for text recognition. So, and we go through this, and in the end we see how can we scale. So it's a bit of code. Don't get scared, this is all quite easy code. Um, the first thing is sometimes when you receive scans, or a big scan pipeline people, they put the sheets on the scanner, and sometimes they are quite corrupt. They are a little bit skewed, rotated, whatever. And um, most of the tools that you have, they have big problems. And what we noticed is it's quite easy to write to write some code to rotate pages. So let's look into this kind of algorithm. It's a few lines of code. Um, so this is a sample page. It's a, the page is bigger. There's one sample out of a magazine. And you see, this is how a lot of scans appear. And uh, if you try to, to recognize text in any, with any tool, you will get really, really bad results. Even though these tools have a rotation engine or rotation algorithm inside, um, it's very generic and often doesn't work so well. But first thing that we can do is let's binarize this image. And the next algorithm that we use, it works best on, on black, uh, white on black images. So the first thing is, so what is binarization? You see here it's a thresholding. And we simply say everything um, with a pixel value that's uh, less than uh, 200, it gets black, and everything else is white, or it, it, it's on maximum. Now we have a colored image. So, and you see here, even thresholding, it's super fast. So I don't show you, we don't have so much time. I won't show you the, the code in live. But this one is a really, really fast operation. We use OpenCV, Open Computer Vision. It's an awesome open source library, which is open sourced by Intel. Um, and it's, it's fairly easy to, to convert such images with just a few lines of code, one line of code. OK, so what's the next thing? We want to detect lines to see, do we have to rotate the image? Another um, great algorithm, also in OpenCV, is the half lines or probabilistic half lines with a few parameters. Like we give him the line length, uh, we're leaving the max line gap, so the gaps that uh, this algorithm searches and allows to have basically um, gaps in a full line. So he tries to find lines um, where there's no gap that's longer than 20 pixels. Um, and what we do is if we can find lines with just one line of code, then uh, we look over all the lines, take a simple average of the angle of that line to the uh, 180 degrees. And uh, after that, we simply rotate the image, which is a fairly simple um, yeah, call of OpenCV. I don't even have it in here. And uh, we basically correct our image by, by the uh, average angle. How does it look? So what we see here is we get the lines, fine. 
we, we take the coordinates out of it, we calculate the angle, and sum all these angles that we find up. This is the naive approach. Of course, if you have a little bit harder examples, you might want some quantization. Um, there are sometimes some, some problems in it. So what you take is the most, you, you take the lines um, that are all quite similar. All right. We calculate the average angle, and that's what we need to correct our page. OK, minus 7 degrees. Let's see how it, how it works. Quite well. Um, this is basically production code, and it works really, really good. And you see here, we find most of the lines we find. We get a sum of all these, average them, and uh, even these outliers here, they don't hurt us so much. You, but you can quantify them away, even that. Uh, this technique, it, it works quite awesome. It even works for passports. Um, so we do a lot of text detection in passports, IDs, and, and, and. And it, it's perfect to basically put the IDs in the right in the right way. All right. The next thing. So we can rotate an image. What we've noticed is an image has a lot of text, different text sizes, and, and, and. And uh, what we want to find out is where are text segments that look similar. And most of the time, text segments that look similar, that are the segments that are close together. And uh, that leads us to the problem. Let's break it a little bit down. Um, we want to find text segments first that we can feed to our algorithm or to Tesseract. Um, and for that, we use dilation and erode. Um, this is also a few lines of code and simple probabilistic computing, um, which means it's fast, uh, to just detect text segments. Um, and for that, a dilation is nothing more than a convolution. It's basically a kernel, everything on. And it's a matrix multiplication in a sliding window, and you assign the value in the, in the middle of your sliding window, basically here. Does everybody know what a convolution is? No? <laughs> That's a convolution. So if you hear a convolutional neural network, it's basically pretty close to what we are doing here. Just uh, you don't use the, the OR or AND operator. You simply do a multiplication by a random initialized sliding window. And you add always the value of this uh, multiplication basically in the, cent in the center. And this is how uh, the TensorFlow or whatever convolutional networks are made up and what kind of these kind of matrices here, the kernels get trained to get better features. That's the whole idea of convolutional networks. Um, <coughs> so let's look how this works. What we see here is we, we, we start dilation. Dilation means we want to have broader whites. So if we notice something white, we want to make a make little bit more fat. So that's nice, that's what we see here. So we bring these kind of segments closer together. And you already notice here you have got some good lines. Cool. We do the same part here again with a little bit different kernel, a kernel that's not a square, but a kernel that's pretty large. And afterwards, we do an erode. And erode is basically the opposite of a delayed. It just shrinks the whites a little bit down. But what we do with this closing operation, uh, we narrow down the gaps. So if there was a, we delayed. We shrink down, and what we have is where was a dark point before there's no white. And what we have here is we start closing together things that belong together. We simply merge text with pixels. And now, if we do a find contour, that's also OpenCV, fairly easy to find contours in a an, in an picture, um, we find boxes. And we find the boxes from the stuff that we connected. And uh, a little bit of filtering, that's naive. We have better approaches. But basically, this is already enough to filter all the boxes that do not belong, so all the contours that are too small. And if we see, after filtering, what happens? An algorithm that selects stuff that belongs together in nearly every application, in nearly every image, with a few lines of code. It's nice magic. If you show this to management, everybody is happy. Um, and it's just a few lines of code, pretty fast operations with convolutions. So these are the text parts. Cool. Let's look again. We have more. <coughs> there's somewhere in the talk, there's the, there stands AI and TensorFlow. Just to, to bring, uh, bring everything down to the real thing, um, we do not use TensorFlow for abject character recognition. There are way better models built by way into more intelligent people than, for example, me. Um, with a lot of more training data. 
to build uh, object character recognition. It's a solved problem, and I would like to utilize what's got, what we got. But what we noticed is we had a lot of pictures. Pictures take processing time, and pictures lead to problems. Um, and what we did is, because we didn't find a solution before, we trained a classifier that can decide between pictures and decide between written text. So we can filter out, and we can, on the pictures, for example, filter what's on the picture and put this also in an index. And this classifier is a simple convolutional net. Looks pretty close to the MNIST example, but it's fine. It's fast. It works pretty well. Um, the results after evaluation was a 100% recognition rate. And I couldn't believe that. So what we started here, and this is the next important thing, that I, if you use TensorFlow, if you lose Keras, if you lose, uh, use convolutional neural networks, look what the network is looking on. So, and there is a thing, thing, it's called GradCam, computer um, aided segmentation, and uh, what you can do is basically, you can use the, the gradients from your machine learning model and apply them to the last convolutional layer and basically calculate back of a sample image um, why did your convolutional network decided for a class and because of what segments in your image. And that's what you see here. So we looked at our own um, results and said, hey, what made you decide for this class, for text? And it's quite nice. What you see here, the red things, it's like a heat map. The red part makes the convolutional network decide why it's text. And it's looking at text. And you see here the blue one. This one was which is a little bit deciding against it, but it's fine. And if we compare it with an image, we can see, oh, nice. There are some, whatever it looks at, <laughs> but there are some edges that are not normal for text. And because of these edges, because of everything that's red, it decided that this class here is a picture. So that's the next step. If you have a, a model and you want a little bit to understand what your model is doing, try to visualize where the CNN, where your network is looking at. That's one learning that we got from us. Cool. OK, that's the AI part So for the easy things. But it works quite well. Tesseract, what does it do? It's an instance, it's a binary that you can basically use. And you have a lot of um, yeah, <laughs> libraries around it, like we are using PyOCR. It's uh, open source. It's maintained by a small group of people. But I can really, really um, recommend it because they are really responsive. So I had a question. I found something. And uh, they were responsive in releasing a new version in, in just a few days. So um, really nice guys. Tesseract internally uses a neural network an LSTM, and what you get out is a format which gives you lines, words, and locations that it detected. How does it look? PSM is a page segmentation mode. There's a lot in the documentation where you can look in. Um, the interesting part is here, create HOCR, which gives you basically lines. In lines are words, and you can concatenate them. And uh, you see here also, if you build the right Docker container with Tesseract inside, um, it's fairly easy to use it. And it, after the pre-processing, it gives you, so we have a rate of 80% um, of 100% recognition rate. So 80% of, of all images have a recogni recognition rate of 100%. That's the next interesting question. Um, how do we get the recognition rate? And uh, that's where we use Elasticsearch for. And uh, this is where you can really uh, make a difference so what you see here is the, the Levenstein distance that we are using. Uh, if we have a word recognized with a typo, um, we have an index which contains a dictionary. And this is the dictionary of uh, the, the German language. That's where you're working in. And the dictionary of domain, domain uh, language. For example, we are working for an insurance company. An insurance company has some special words in Germany for the whole domain. And uh, having these two in our dictionary gives us the possibility to get word suggestions for every word that we recognized. And our naive approach is, let's see if we find words that are in the dictionary that's a hit. And if not, at least give us some suggestions. And uh, if we find a document that has all words already in the dictionary and we don't need any suggestion, we have a 100% recognition rate. 
All right, it's a quite naive approach, but it works good and it gives you a nice ground truth if you work on that kind of topic. Plus, we use the Elasticsearch also as a search engine to, have, to be able to search inside pictures with this kind of metadata. And you even get pictures where Tesseract was uh, detecting a typo, um, which means we have two ways to, to make our model better. We can uh, make our dictionary better, maybe add something to the domain-specific language. We can uh, build up on picture pre-processing and make our pictures better, or even uh, use new versions of Tesseract and uh, compile them maybe in a better manner to make Tesseract faster. So you have a lot of little things where you can work on, um, basically just for, for detecting text, and uh, you can utilize Elasticsearch that gives you some real nice suggestions and um, yeah, makes searching way easier. And this is, uh, yeah, this is the real, real world, and it works really fast. Um, five minutes left. Perfect. Uh, last slide. Scalability. Now we want to talk about scalability. So, OK, Elasticsearch, scalability by itself. You can scale it around clusters. Um, fine. But how can you scale the OCR process itself? What I've shown you, rotation. Um, delation and, and text segmentation, sharpening of text, maybe um, deleting some watermarks, all the stuff that we do. Um, we put it into, into their own containers, and per container we can really scale to wherever you like. So you can't make the process itself faster, but where you can really well scale is um, you can basically make more images or, or be able to detect more text in more images at the same time. Um, for example, so what did we notice is, first of all, um, it's a quite, quite old setup, which gets uh, better is we, we don't have any Kubernetes whatsoever. So no, no nice um, load balancing or let's say no, no nice load utilization. But what we could notice is we can build containers with simple Docker um, onboard uh, utilities um, to apply to every container a 90% load all the time, which is awesome for, for ops. Um, the guys from, from operations, they loved it because they say, hey, um, please go to 90%. It's not allowing something, but we utilize the full CPU, all the VMs quite well. Um, and we can even structure our, our infrastructure landscape to have uh, pre-processing parts, to have uh, rotationing parts, or um, to have here Tesseract recognition parts. And this is really important because what you see is what I've shown you, the small pre-processing steps, they are super fast. They are in 0.1 seconds per image. That's fine. But Tesseract itself, 300 DPIs, DPIs takes around 12 seconds. And the goal is to have 140 images per day, 140,000 images per day to recognize. And for that, what you need is a really, really good scalability mechanism. And the next part is if you look here, your elastic needs to be quite well optimized. So um, the speaker before and elastic new features. Um, some of the new features he mentioned, like bootstrapping um, and bootstrapping checks, that was, were all things that hit us. Um, this part here, you have to see elastic is asking for every word in the text. Elastic gets asked on its image, uh, on its index, did you know this word? which results in 1,000 calls, okay, with batching, but 1,000 queries basically per image, per use. Um, if you do this for 140,000 images per day, you know what kind of load Elastic is working on. Our current dictionary is around 3 million words large. And um, yeah, in the end, we store all the results, all the metadata, basically in Elastic, and provide it as a big, big search engine layer in front of texts. Basically, that's, this is the, the small journey, a little bit of what I wanted to show you. And I think the five minutes are done quite fast. Thanks.